guys church we want to talk about here. That's the church of Thessalonica. And then next week, we're gonna write, I'm going to give you like a little summary sheet. We're going to go over all the different churches we're going to go on there. And then we're going to come right and talk about Charity Baptist. So be here next week. Give your input. What are some great qualities of Charity Baptist Church? What are some great attributes of Charity Baptist Church? What are some great things that are very aligned with the Bible that will glorify God? What are some of these things that we might do uh, as a New Testament church that line up with these other New Testament church. And then I want to recognize what we do good, and then I want to recognize what we're lacking, amen? What we should be focusing on, what we could be doing, so we could be closer to a New Testament, biblical, gospel-preaching, God-honoring type of church, amen? According to the New Testament. So I'm going to share with you four points here today that I really believe that kind of stand out, that kind of share, that stand out about the church at Thessalonica. There's four things here, and I just want to get to it right away. First Thessalonians chapter 1, <clears throat> and I want you to hear what Paul says to this church that pretty much stands out here. And it says here, um, and starting in verse 2, 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 2, We give thanks to God always for you all, making mention of you in our prayers. Look at now, remembering without ceasing your work of faith and labor of love, and patience of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ, in the sight of God and our Father, knowing, brethren, beloved, your election of God. Can I tell you this morning, Paul came right off the bat and gave, gave a compliment to this church, what he saw from a difference when he was there, and now what he's praying for this church, what came to his mind right off the bat. It says here, the work of faith, the labor of love, and the patience of the hope of the Lord Jesus Christ. Man, they're looking on to Jesus to come. So I, I want to share, that's, that's the first point we're going to talk about this morning. And I want to share about this labor of love, this work of faith that he was talking about this church. How, what kind of stuff are we talking about here? What is there that we're doing? What is some of the biblical uh, principles that we can grab a hold of that God teaches us to have a, a work of faith? A labor of love. Amen. Let's pray. Father, again, thank you so much. Lord, I pray you bless, Lord, this message. I pray we can look at ourselves. Are we lining up with a labor of love? Are we lining up with the work of faith? Uh, everything honoring unto you and looking for your coming and with great patience, as it says here in, in the, uh, the church here at Thessalonica. Lord, I pray now you bless this sermon. In Jesus' name, amen. If you notice here, Paul, right off the bat here, the first point, starting off this epistle, and, and the first one here, he talks about what he recognizes in this church. Now, you know, isn't every church have a work of faith? They do. But I've got to tell you what happens in many churches that die out. They lose their labor of love. They could do certain things. What happens in most churches, people love coming for the food and the fellowship, but they don't like doing the work before the food and fellowship. No, not at churches today. Oh, yeah, they'll be here for the food, and they'll show up like five minutes before the food comes out. Where were you the last two hours? We've been working. No, come on. Yes, that's, it really does. That's what happens. So can I tell you, listen, the work of faith is something that we set out to do, and we pray, and we set out to do. Can I tell you, we've been doing that for years here at Charity Baptist Church. How do you know? Well, I'm going to be honest, we're doing it right now. So what do you mean? Uh... We're going to get ready to do this, redo this roof here on the back porch because water's getting in. And it ruins some of our brand new floor. The, the wood's rotting out. We recognize that. So what are we doing? We start, so between, between uh, uh, Brother Don here getting some materials left over from job sites, I'm calling other people to give us some supplies, and we're doing it by faith to see how much we can accumulate before we have to spend any money to do the job. Then when we get ready to do the job, are we got all the people that want to come out to participate to help out because many hands might like work. How do you do that? You bathe it in prayer. You ask God to supply. You ask God for the right time and when the weather's good. Then you go ahead and you execute it. We've been doing this since day one, have we not, Paul? Everything from windows to flooring to painting to this room, the listen, the whole nine yards, work of faith. We're going to go out there and we're going to evangelize. Every time we go to evangelize with the work of faith and the labor that we love because we love the Lord, we go door to door. Every time we go door to door, somehow God brings people in that we didn't go door to door with. 
What do you mean by that? We did groat. We used to knock on groat like 100 times over, up and down groat. And then people started showing up from South Buffalo. Like, we didn't go door knocking in South Buffalo. How did you know about our church? I don't know, just someone told me about it. What? We're up and down growth, knocking on doors on growth. We're going out there telling people about Jesus. We're passing out tracks as we're walking down the street. We thought maybe from that point some fruit would come out. No, God's bringing people from somewhere else because why? God honored our obedience to, to go out there and witness with the gospel and preach the gospel and teach the gospel and evangelize the gospel. Amen? And it's just, we got to get back to that. And that's why this summer is very vital and very important and so fast is from our church itself and also our children's ministry. But that was a work of faith. Every time this church has done that, God has blessed our church. But then we stopped. And there's two reasons why. The lack of workers to do the work of faith and the lack of love to labor because we got to understand this for him, because we love him and we love souls. But most of all, we love that gospel. So we, how many here are happy someone took the time out for you to get saved? How many, here, or how many here are happy that someone took their time out and their love for you to share with you the gospel? Isn't that precious? Now it's our turn to love a sinner, to love the lost, and to love God, and to love this gospel, and I'll tell someone else about it. It's not about us no more. Look up here. It's not about us no more. Right from the beginning to now, it's still about him. And now it's about all the lost souls out there. It's not about you no more. You just come here and get, you, get charged up. They go out there and focus on what God needs us to do. To glorify him with the labor of love and a work of faith. It says here in Hebrews chapter 6, verse 10, So for God is not unrighteous to forget your work and labor of love, which ye have showed towards his name, and that ye have ministered to the saints and do minister. Listen, can I tell you something? It's good that what we're doing here today and what we do on, on certain days, like even like our Bible study. Look, don't, if you can make it to Bible study, make it for Bible study downstairs. He's doing the prayer of Solomon. Our overcomers classes for folks that are struggling with addictions. It's a labor of love. There's not many churches here in the city of Buffalo that have a church that cares about people that are struggling with addictions. There, there really isn't. Why? They're too busy living life. Uh, uh, to sit there around the Word and pray and get, get on it and get in the Bible and, and learn and grow. Many churches today are staggered in growth because Christians don't want to be, to be taught and to learn and to study to grow thereof. They're too content where they're at. Can I encourage you? We need to be like the church of Thessalonica. Start falling in love back with God again. Amen? I want, to, I want to learn how to labor out of love for God and, and understand how much God labored for me on that cross of Calvary and love me back, amen? That's what we need to do, work of faith. Turn over to 1 Corinthians chapter 10, if you could. Grab your Bibles. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, if you could. 1 Corinthians chapter 10. <clears throat> Folks, everything we do for the cause of Christ, everything we do for the work of faith, everything we do for the labor of love, to promote and, and, and to share people about Jesus is all for his glory, amen? And Paul taught this church in Corinth, and I believe the church at Thessalonica got a hold of this thing. It says here in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, look at verse 31, very familiar verse. And this, right, hits, this hits every good Baptist church here, but let's get off the food and the drink, okay? Let's focus on other things. It says, whether, whether therefore ye eat or drink, or whatsoever you do, do all for the glory of God. We do that pretty well, don't we? Praise the Lord, give me another burger. Hallelujah, one more scoop of potato salad. Woo! But we need to change that off of potato salad and burgers. Let's get out of here and go, come on, one more block. Let's tell, tell people about Jesus. One more block, Brother Jones. For the glory of God. But I'm sweating. I'm dying. That's okay. Jesus sweat blood in the garden. Amen. Amen. We can sweat one more block. You eat, we, listen, you and I need to lose pounds anyhow. We're trying to burn the calories off. Hallelujah, right? Who cares? One more block ain't hurt nothing. Let's go burn the calories off. Let's sweat all the junk out of us. Sweating's good. You get all those toxins out of you. Amen. Let's do it one more time. Labor of love. This church here in Thessalonica had a labor of love. We had a work of faith. How are we doing here at Charity Baptist? Look, if you could, real quickly now. Let's go over to uh, chapter 4, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, if you could. <clears throat> chapter 4. 
jump over there a little bit. And I want you to see what Paul tried to do to this church. He tried to exhort this church. He tried to encourage this church in some ways. And if you look at chapter 4, and I'm going to read down 1 through 8 real quickly, if you could. <clears throat> Verse 1 through 8. Chapter 4, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, starting in verse 1, says this. Furthermore, then we beseech you, brethren, and exhort you by the Lord Jesus, that ye have received us how ye ought to walk and to please God, so you should, that you would abound more and more. For ye know what commandments we gave you by the Lord Jesus. For this is the will of God, even your sanctification, that you should abstain from fornication, that every one of you should know how to possess his vessel in sanctification and honor, not in the lust of concupiscence, even as the Gentiles which know not God, that no man go beyond and defraud his brother in any matter, because that the Lord is the avenger of all such. As we also have forewarned you and testified, for God hath not called us unto uncleanness, but on the holiness. He, the, the, he therefore that despised, despiseth no man, but God who hath also given unto us his Holy Spirit. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, 1 through 8. Eight verses here he tried to encourage this church to walk the, walk the walk. Amen? And the first thing he talked about was holiness. If you look here, he said, walk in holiness. He wants you to walk and to please God in holiness. Can I tell you, you can't live two lives. You can't be something you're not. You're either with God or you're not with God. You either want to let you want you, either you want to go ahead and let God shine truthfully, or you don't want God to shine truthfully in your life. I'm just trying to tell you here today, folks, we need God to shine in our lives. We really do. We can't, we cannot wait any longer for anything. We need to walk holy. When we go out there in the world, we need to be, when people look at us, we say, wow, you're something different about you. I'm just being honest with you. They're only going to know that by your countenance, by your speech, by your behavior, your actions. What comes out of your mouth? How you interact? What do you do in certain situations? On the streets and everything else? Holiness. Jesus says, be he holy for I am holy. Doesn't mean be is it be perfect, perfect, be mature. Listen, we need to be more Christ-like, amen? amen. And I'm gonna tell you, I believe true holiness comes from your love for God. Yeah. Right? What do you mean by that, Pastor Pete? If you love God, you're not gonna want to choose sin. If you love God, you're not gonna choose the world. If you love God, you're not gonna choose the pleasures of this life. You're gonna sit there and do what God wants you to do. You're not going to choose lust. You're going to choose love. Amen? And if you love God, the more you love God, and the more you love God, and the more you do because you love God, and the more you, love, you labor for the love of God, and you, you do it all for the sake of loving God, you're not going to do anything that's contrary to the things of God. Amen? Turn over to Isaiah chapter 30. Keep your finger there. For a second, don't lose that. Part, but turn over to Isaiah chapter 35, if you could. Isaiah chapter 35. Isaiah chapter 35, we'll start, when you get there, we'll start in verse, verse 8, Isaiah chapter 35. <clears throat> it says in Acts chapter 3, verse 12, says, And when Peter saw it, he, he answered unto the people, Ye men of Israel, why marvel ye at this? Or why look ye so earnestly on us? Though by our own power or holiness we had made this man to walk. Now, if you look in the context of that whole scripture there, uh, they were given some, some powers to, to heal people in the book of Acts for a sign to the Jews to believe. Amen? But can I tell you, how many here will ever lay hands on people and pray over them? And see, God answered prayer. I have. I have. It wasn't because of me. It wasn't because of the people that laid hands on them. It was because of God intervened and took care of business. But you want holy men, right? You want holy men. You want holy men that are going to sit there and pray about certain things. I remember when I was on deputation, I used to go to all the little kids. I used to sit there and look at the little kids. I go, will you pray for me? And I would look at the little kid and I go, pray for me. 
Here's my prayer card. I want you to pray for me. And all their parents were around, all these adults around her goes, why am I only asking the kids? Because they're still innocent. The world hasn't tainted the, the, the world's already tainted the adults. Get it? I don't, know what, I don't know how they live. I don't know how those adults live. I don't know what they're doing outside of church. I don't know what they're doing in their walk with God. I don't know what they could have. They could have ought against a brother in their church. They could have sin in their life that's been hidden under, under, under the carpet. They could whatever in the rug. So I go to little kids and go, pray for me. So there's a church, there's a church out there that supports me, and the whole entire Christian school supports this ministry. As I praise the Lord, because I you know sometimes you just can't trust adults. They say they're going to pray, but they don't. So what they did at that Christian school, what they do is they, every morning they take a missionary and they pray. And so at least once a week they're praying for the Wigdor family and Charity Mission, Charity Baptist Mission, amen? Every week, at least once a week. I say, hallelujah. Maybe those kids will get through. I don't know how the adults are. See, why is it? Because you know why? Because they're innocent still. They're tender. God's still molding and working on them. I'm just being honest with you. People that, that are living holy want to be in church, want to gravitate to God, want to, want to know more, want to, I mean, it's just hard. You say, well, that's kind of judgmental, isn't it? You're saying that? I go, listen, I'm going to tell you right now. I have a hard time missing church. I am going to be, I'm going to go on vacation soon. Okay, I, I need a little mountaintop recovery, you know, recovery. But that's, that's, that's planned, you know what I mean? That's planned. But I hate missing church. I'm here Tuesday. I'm here Tuesday mornings, not right, Chet? With work, people ink. I'm here. I'm here Tuesday mornings. I'm here Tuesday evenings. I'm here. I'm here Thursday Thursdays. I'm here almost every other Saturday, if not three Saturdays out of the month. I'm here every Sunday. I just love being here and taking care of God's house and doing God's work. I had people tell me. I says you you demand too much, Pastor Pete. No, why? I'm not demanding nothing. So I want you to just fall in love with God and get busy for God. That's all I care about. I got things to do in my life. I, so do I. Do I have things to do in my life, Paul? I have a lawn that has to be mowed too, you know. I just, I just want you to be holy. I want you to love the Lord. I want you to figure out things, you know. Your schedule might be a little harder than mine. I don't know. You got to seek God's face and all that. I just want you to fall in love with God. I want you to be fueled by the labor of love and the work of faith. I want you to sit there and realize that he's holy, and, and I want you to gravitate to be holy like he is. That's all I care about. You know what? And then you're gonna want, you know what? Now you're going to make time for God. You're going to want to read your Bible and spend time with him and commune with him. How many of you love reading your Bible? When I, get, when I get holy, read your Bible every day. Pray every day. Spend time alone with God. Why are you try, what are you trying to say here? I'm trying, what I'm trying to get at point here is that life's too hectic, and it's pulling you away from Christ. He is, don't, don't tell me he isn't. This world is pulling you away from Christ, the, the, the demands that are going on. You can't be, I, what really kicks me is that I hear people, they have no job, they sit at home and say, I have no time to come to church. But you have no job. What are you doing? Well, things are, like I, you do like three medical appointments a week, and what else do you do? Well, I got to do this, and I got to do that. I go, I do the same thing. We have to clean our house, too. I got to mow a lawn. But what else do you do? I know. You're playing those video games. Did you win anything? Did you save the world? I have a better way to save the world. Tell people about Jesus. <gasps> you mean I got to get off a of PlayStation? You sure do. You mean I got to get off of Xbox? You sure do. You means I can't play? Plays later, man. I say you can't play. But put God first. Holiness. True holiness is when you put God first and you love the Lord and you give all your mind, heart, and soul. Didn't he say that? Who's supposed to get the preeminence? Holiness comes from love. Love. Isaiah 35 here. If you go to Isaiah chapter 35. Look real quick. Verse 8. It says, And a highway shall be there, and a way, and it shall be called the way of holiness. The unclean shall not pass over it, but it shall be for those, the wayfaring men, thou fools shall not ear therein. No lion shall be there, nor ra ravenous beast shall go up, uh, up there unto it. It shall be, not be found there, but the redeemed shall walk there. 
And the ransom of the Lord shall be turned and come to Zion and with songs and everlasting joy upon their heads. They shall obtain joy and gladness and sorrow and sighing shall flee away. When you finally commit to God and you want to live holy, the path becomes a whole lot clearer, folks. Amen? When you want to get serious with God and want to live holy, things become clearer. Things be, I'm going to be honest with you. Things even become simpler. Because you get, your choices become easy. Should I go do this that kept me away from God? Or am I going to keep going this way and keep walking, pressing forward because God's there and things become more joyful, more peaceful, more blessed? Amen? I want to go down that road. Why would you want to go back to misery? Why do you want to go back to tug of war? Why do you want to go back to struggle? Holiness. Walk in holiness. We just talked about walking in love. Go back to 1 Thessalonians. Look at verse 9 and 10. Chapter 4, verse 9 and 10. <clears throat> verse 9 and 10. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 9 and 10 says this. It says, But as touching, but as touching brotherly love, ye need not that I write unto you, for yourselves are taught of God to love one another. So God already did the work already. Paul comes looking, you already got this thing down pat. You know how to love one another. Hallelujah. There's all kinds of ways to love one another, besides just praying, right? How about actually ministering to each other in word and deed, amen? What about going ahead and partnering up with somebody? Can I tell you what's going to happen here? Brother Jones, I'm going to say this. Tell me if I'm wrong. Correct me if I'm wrong, Brother Jones. But we, if you are nervous or hesitant about going out door to door to pass out gospel literature, we will team you up with somebody who's been doing it for years, the last couple years, whatever. We'll team you up one that's been doing it already, and you can go with somebody that's done it. If you're brand new, and you can be able to learn how to go about doing it, how about passing it out. If someone comes and says, "What is it?" and you get how how do you how do you go from that to how to start reading off the whole. Plan of salvation in the backside. Yeah. Amen? Yeah. And, then, and then the person, has, the, the, one that, the one that has been doing it for a while is going to start sharing the plan of salvation. I'll teach you how you can, we'll teach you how to pray while he's going ahead doing it so the Holy Spirit can intervene. Amen? And, and stop any distraction. Amen. Intercept any distraction so that person can focus on the plan of salvation that's being delivered to that soul. Amen? We'll do that for you. We'll, we'll make sure that happens. That's another way you can mentor somebody, disciple somebody, work alongside and have great joy working with others around you for, to minister to souls, to preach the gospel, edifying each other along the way. It says here, again in chapter 4, and in verse, uh, let's go down to verse 10, it says, And indeed ye do it, uh, uh, you, and indeed ye do it toward all the brethren, which are all in Macedonia, but we beseech you, brethren, that ye increase more and more. Meaning, don't stay stagnant. If you go back in the book of Revelation, okay, in the book of Revelation, those churches, the, the one biggest issue with the church is they left their first love. Can I tell you, look at, for a Christian, when you put anything above God, that's what you love. When all you're thinking and all your lust and all you're yearning for and all your desire is every, anything above Christ, that's your idol. I remember my wife and I were dating. I sure lived yesterday at dinner a little bit. I, in the beginning, when we were, my wife and I were meeting each other, I was the jerk. My wife called me a jerk in the very beginning, and then she married that jerk, Amen. <clears throat> But as, but, as we were, as, but as we were getting to know each other and, we're, and we started courting, we started courting to get ready for marriage, I let her know, and she agreed with me, that God comes first. My love for God comes first, and then my love for you will come number two. And I want to see what she was going to say about all that. And she goes, absolutely, same here. Huh. She, made, she made sure I knew the same thing. She looked at me and says, yep, God me first, you're second. You're not going to take away my love for God. Like, you know, we actually kind of like, you know, you back at each other, you know. We made sure of all that. It was very vital. It was very important that our love for, my love for God was first and her love for God was first. And then we started putting God, uh, God's love first in our marriage. Amen. We love God first in our marriage than anything else. That's why we're here this long. It's going to be 30 years 
And she's still surviving me. Amen? Amen. God bless her. Yep. <laughs> it's in August. It's in August. I'll let my wife tell you. Because I don't know. She, she, she always wants to like, don't give away dates. You know, whatever. <clears throat> but to walk in love. Walk in love. Turn, to, turn over, if you could, to Ephesians chapter 5, if you could. Ephesians chapter 5 here. Paul talked to his church in Ephesus about the same thing. Uh, about walking in love, okay? Ephesians chapter 5. As you're turning there, I'll read this in Proverbs 23, 7. It says, For as he thinketh in his heart, so is he. Eat and drink, seeth he in thee, but his heart is not with thee. Amen? Whatever your heart desires, it's going to manifest itself anyhow. If you truly love God, you're not going to put that Bible down. If you truly love God, you're going to want to spend more time in prayer. How would you not want, why would you want less of Jesus and say, I love Jesus, but I don't want to go to, I don't want to go to church. I love Jesus, but I don't want to read my Bible. I love Jesus, but I want to sit there and pray. I mean, what? It's like the opposite. What you love, you're going to invest in, amen? Your, your blood and sweat, you're going to invest. I love God's church, Amen? I love Charity Baptist. That's why I break my back. That's why I sweat. That's why I get dirty. Because I love God's church. I want God's church to look good so that people come in there to get a good impression. And just imagine if we didn't vacuum for a month. We didn't clean toilets for a month. We didn't take the garbage out whenever we felt like it. What happens if we just let things be as it is? What would you think of this church? Mow the lawn whenever we want, we feel like it. it does, they don't care. That's not a good presentation of, of how our love is for God's church. The presentation of how we are. We talked about with the ushers, right? Presenting herself at, 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 at the hallway there. Presenting herself a welcoming spirit, right? You know? What happens if, you, if you're an usher, you're walking, you got boogers coming down your nose, and you're coughing in your hand, and you want to shake someone's hand, and you're wearing a T-shirt with grease, hamburger grease on there from the night before. <laughs> Welcome to Charity Baptist Church. It doesn't go... <clears throat> like, what? Who's this guy? Oh, he's our usher. I mean, what about the pastor? Same thing. If I walk around, I act like an idiot. What do you mean, right? What? <laughs> Sheila! Okay. <clears throat> okay. <Whew. clears throat> you know what I'm saying? I mean... We gotta show some fun. We gotta show us. We gotta show some love. We gotta walk in love. Here in Ephesians chapter five, verse two says this: "And walk in love as Christ also had loved us, and had given us Himself for us, an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling Savior." Amen. I mean, when they come in there, that the the, the impression walking out of here with an impact. Amen. I just try to tell you that we need. I really believe we're at, we're at a we're at a pivotal point now in Christianity where. God's people are not getting serious about God. They're being swayed away with life issues, finances, health, house, pleasures of life. I'm not saying don't take a vacation. Please don't take it to the other extreme. But if you're out of church morning and you're in church, there's something wrong with that. Is there things, is, is there emergencies? Absolutely. Absolutely. Poor, please pray for Jen and Pete. That breaks my heart. I mean, Jen's on fire to serve God. Peace finally getting his feet wet. He's loving Thursday nights. He wants to start getting involved. Pray for that poor family. Comfort, strength, wisdom, and all. Protection. I'm just trying to say is that, I can tell you again, when the devil's fighting you, there has to be something good going on. The devil won't doesn't mess with anybody. Nothing's going on good on. I mean, you, it could be because this church is trying to live holy. It could be because this church wants to love sinners and love, love each other. Amen? I'm just trying to tell you that. Be, be careful with it. Look at verse 11 and 12 here in chapter 4. It says this. <clears throat> 11 and 12. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. We're in the same chapter. We're not going to leave there. Keep in that chapter. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 11 and 12 says this. And that ye study to be quiet... And do your own business, and to work with your own hands as we commanded you, that ye may walk honestly toward them that were without, that ye may have lack of nothing. Wow. 
What are you trying to talk about? Listen, there's some folks that need to know how to get what you got. Say what? What got you to this place of, of faith? What got you to this place of maturity in your life as being a Christian? What got you to the place of being excited about doing something for God? You need to pass it on. Don't look at what happens many times. Don't brag and be all self-righteous about it. But be diligent to stay the course. And then be diligent to help another. Amen? You might even have to teach them how to, how, how they're, how, you might teach them how to read their Bible a little better. How to pray a little better. How to maybe team up with you to do something great for God. Maybe going or passing out tracts along the streets. Just walk the streets and pass them out. Get on the phone. Maybe there's somebody that they want it, that they need to hear about Jesus and say, can you go with me? I need my friend to get saved. Can you go with me, please? You're going to have to make time. Be diligent about it to make time to do so. I'm just trying to tell you, you've got to be diligent. If you could, turn over to Proverbs chapter 4. Proverbs chapter 4, if you could. Keep your finger there at 1 Thessalonians. Don't lose that spot now. Don't take your finger off of that. <clears throat> As you're turning over to Proverbs chapter 4, I want to read you this here in 2 Peter chapter 1, starting in verse 5. And 2 Peter chapter 1 and verse 5 says this. It says, And besides this, given all diligence, add to your faith virtue, and to your virtue knowledge, and to knowledge temperance, and to temperance patience, and to patience godliness, and to godliness brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness charity. And if these things be in you, and abound, that ye make you that ye shall be neither barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen? But he that lacketh these things is blind and cannot see afar off, and hath forgotten, look at now, and hath forgotten that he was purged from his old sins. Wherefore, the rather, brethren, give diligence to make your calling and election sure. For if you do these things, you should never, look at it, never fall. Don't ever forget where you came from, but never go back. <clears throat> You've got to keep moving forward. You've got to be diligent in moving forward. You've got to keep adding on your life. We talked about that in our, in our overcomers class. We just went ahead. We talked about inventory. You already got God's giving you all this victory in your, in your life, and now you're here and he's working on some stuff, but where do you see yourself a year from now? What are those things in your life that you know you've got to get rid of, that got to go so you can add to what already God has done? If you're here this morning, and you know you're saved and born again, you're going on the way to heaven, you've got to be diligent. Stop. Look, Christians are stagnant. Why are not churches growing? Why are not people getting excited about giving the gospel anymore? Why aren't people getting serious about God? Because they're in a spiritual rut. They've been hypnotized by this world. They've been sitting around on the pleasures of life, and they won't allow God to move them unless there's a tragedy. A tragedy has to hit their household. A tragedy has to hit their life. A tragedy has to hit this world that we live in today in order to wake us up and say, I gotta get back to church. I gotta get serious with God. I gotta grab my Bible. I gotta start praying and reading again. No, 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 no. You should have already been doing that if you only started exercising diligence. Look at now. Start adding. You, you're not perfect yet. I'm not perfect yet. I haven't arrived. I'm, I'm not, I've been saved for over 30 years. You're not perfect, Pastor Pete? No. God's still working on me. I'm spiritually ugly still. And he's trying to make me pretty spiritually. I got a lot of rough edges got to be rubbed off. I got to be molded. I'm not, God ain't done with me. He's begun a good work, as it says in Philippians 1, 6, right? But until the day of Christ. Look where you could at Proverbs chapter 4 real quick. Proverbs chapter 4. It says this. Keep thy heart with all diligence, for out of it are the issues of life. Amen? You better protect that heart. Where to keep that heart intact because guess what? Whatever possesses your heart is what comes out of your life. Come I mean, here, pray for the folks that are, I mean, some are sick. Some have, issues, have some, tra some important things, but pray for these folks. It's like every week there's something going on. Pray for them. Pray for them. Pray for them. Because 
I tell everybody now, if everybody that says they're a member of Charity Baptist Church here today, this place would be full. Think about it. How do you know that? Because I have a whole list. I pray for you. I pray for them all. But every week there's something. Every week there's something going on that keeps them out of church. And I ask them, are you reading your Bible at least? Are you reading your Bible? Are you praying? Are you reading your Bible? Well, well, uh, well. And it breaks my heart because they're not. When you start humbling and bumbling on your words, then you're not. Well, diligence. Because guess what? Someone's sucking you in to back to the world. Someone's deceiving you. It's that roaring lion, amen? He's trying to devour you a little bit. I'm going to get, look over real quick now to chapter 5. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. 1 <clears throat> Thessalonians chapter 5, if you could. I want to start in verse 12. Of, go over to verse 12. Go to verse 12, amen. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, starting in verse 12, says this. And we beseech you, brethren, to know them which labor among you, and are over you in the Lord, and admonish you, and to esteem them very highly in love for their work's sake, and to be at peace among yourselves. Hmm, what is that talking about? Anybody can tell me what that's talking about? Anybody know what those two verses are talking about? I mean, I'm, I'm going to hold myself accountable now. What's that? Pastors, Pastors teachers, and elders, yes. Ask me a question. I want, I was honest now, I want you to come to me. You can tell me, you don't do it now, but come to me afterwards. And I, I'm not here to get a pity party here either, but I want to tell you, I hold myself accountable to a higher standard than you do. Probably to yours, I don't know, maybe I'm wrong, but I hold myself to a high standard. I try to set the example in this church, not only to be the pastor to minister spiritual things, but also it's not beneath me to clean a toilet. Okay? If it's beneath you to clean a toilet, then, sh that, then you, uh, okay, all right? I'm just saying, from the get-go, 15, 17, whatever, how many years ago we started here, it was never beneath me. Whatever I would ask you to do, I've already done it or I'm doing it. Is that, is that, a, good, is that a good leadership? Okay, yes or no? Okay. Where I fall short in is because I can't be in two places at the same time or be two people in the same place. I'm going to share this a little bit. And I'm going to bring on two, a couple, well, three people here, okay? Brother Paul, before he got injured, he'd always say, get in your office! Go play, go do your pastor thing. <laughs> Yesterday, I had to go mop the floor, and Brother Jones is there, and he goes, go up there and finish your sermon. Go up there and finish your sermon. I got this, right? And then during the week when we're working on our projects, Don goes, stop. Stop. I got this. Just mind your own business. Because I was the one that always had to get it going, right? And I still today, I gather up, I call people, gather free supplies or, or see where I can go pick something up. Or, hey, do you have this? I'm the one hustling to try to get things that we lack so we can have it here. So we can get busy doing it. Okay. But I hope to God that I'm not failing you in any area as a pastor, as a servant of Christ, a teacher, and preacher of the gospel. Because my intention is not to do so. The problem is I can't be everything and everybody for everybody. That's why we need more mature men and women to carry on the load of visiting and praying and doing. It takes a church, not a pastor, it takes a church to do great things for God and the furtherance of the gospel. Amen? The pastor can't do anything. There's churches today that are so old, of all the people, because and they've gone through four or five pastors because they ran the pastor to the ground and got him out because he wasn't good enough. They wanted him to do everything, but the people want to sit there and boss the pastor around. I know a little plenty of them. There's also people that want to have, they, they're demanded to do this, that, and the other thing, and they didn't do it. I'm just trying to tell you. And then the other way around, I see pastors run people out the door because they're trying to pound them to the ground, right? Listen, we, we're here to work together, amen?
And it says here uh, in Galatians 5.13, I'll just read this for brethren, ye have, ye have been called unto liberty. Only use li not liberty for the occasion to the flesh, but to love, look at now, love and serve one another. Amen? All the things that I do here is not just for me to look good. It's to make God's house better and God's ministry better so we can serve one another for the cause of Christ. Amen? Is that a good thing or a bad thing? That's a good thing, right? We're here to serve one another, pray for one another, love one another, serve one another. Um, it says in Romans 1, 9, it says, For God is my witness, whom I serve with my spirit in the gospel of his Son. And without ceasing, I make mention of you always in my prayer. I, when I look at you, I, want to see, I, I pray I see you being used by God at your fullest potential. How we're going to get there, I don't know. <laughs> that depends on how much you want to yield yourself to Christ. How much will you allow me to teach you and mentor you and, and help you get to that? Your walk with God. <clears throat> Amen? Our duty to serve. It's our duty to serve. It goes down here now in verse 14 and 15. It goes on in verse 14 and 15. Now we exhort you, brethren, one that are unruly, uh, comfort the feeble-minded, support the weak, be patient toward, toward all men, seeing that none render evil for evil on any, any man, but ever follow that which is good, both among yourselves and to all men. Amen? That's pretty good. I, if there's ever a ministry that try to fits a lot of needs, it's this church right here, right? We do it Tuesday. We have, a, we have an addictions class. We go out soul winning. We have a clothing pantry. I mean, we got all kinds of stuff to try to help those in need. But we always keep the forefront is the gospel. They get gospel tracts. They get, on Tuesday night, they get to hear the gospel. They get talked to with the gospel, right? We talk off to the side more about the gospel. We got people that they used to go on Tuesday now come here on Sunday. I'm just being honest with you. We do pretty good on that, right? Proverbs, four, Proverbs chapter 14, 21. He that despises his neighbor sinneth, but he that have mercy on the poor, happy is he. Amen? God wants us to read the poor in spirit, poor, poor in need of Jesus. Look a little further here. It talks about, let's go down in verse 23 through 28, and I'm going to be closing up here very quickly here. It says here in verse 23, says this, And the very God of peace sanctify you wholly, and I pray, God, your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless unto the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. Faithful is he that calleth you, who also will do it. Brethren, pray for us. Greet all brethren with a holy kiss, except here. I want no holy kiss. Just give me a handshake. Fist pump, amen? I charge you by the Lord that this epistle be read uh, uh, unto all the holy brethren. And grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you, amen? Can I tell you something here? The truth is important. Amen? The truth is important. The truth will set you free, the Bible says. We need to be sanctified through the word to, be, to have, get the truth. Amen? It says in 3 John chapter 1, verse 4, it says, I have no greater joy than to hear that my children walk in truth. Can I tell you today, I, the, the type of preaching I do when I go to some of these other churches that support, support me, and there's times in the past that I just... I'm really I'm mind boggled. But I shared some of our experiences here at Charity. I remember preaching on Syracuse to the church, and I preached about how even the elect get seduced, amen? How even the, the, the saved get seduced by, by, by the things of this world and by the devil and everything else. And I shared some of my counseling sessions, didn't name names, that I had in my office dealing with certain things going on. Didn't know that a week later the pastors called me and go, What did you do? What did you do? I've had four women come to my office. And two of them I'm already doing marriage counseling with. These four women came to me, didn't know that they were abused as a child. All types of abuse. Use a fill in the blank. You know where I'm getting at. They didn't have the courage or the boldness to come forward and say, Pastor, I need help, and this is the area I need help in. But the truth was preached. The truth got in the mind and the heart to start thinking, and these four women came forward, and this pastor was able to minister and, and counsel four marriages, and he was able to salvage three of them. All from the, what happened to the wife as a child that came and carried over into the marriage. Folks, truth is important. Truth because it gets down to the nitty-gritty of what's really going on, the root of the problem of someone's life, amen, or someone's walk with God 
or someone's just someone whatever. You got to be truthful with God so God can be truthful with you. Amen. Turn over to Second Thessalonians chapter two, and we'll close with this. <clears throat> Second Corinthians. I mean, sorry, Second Thessalonians, and in chapter two, if you could. And we'll close with this. We're just going to skip the we're going to skip the last song, brothers Sam. All right. It seemed to be very important to get through this. Second Thessalonians, if you could look over, if you could in chapter two, look over verse fifteen through seventeen. It says, "Therefore, brethren, stand fast, and hold the tradition which ye have been taught, whether by word or by epistle." Now our Lord Jesus Christ himself and God, even our Father, which hath loved us and have given us everlasting consolation and good hope through grace, comfort your hearts and establish you in every good word and work. I want you to notice it says, stand, it says stand fast. Steadfastness is very important. What do you mean? You've got to keep going on. Keep on keeping on. Amen? Don't stop. Don't stop. Don't stop. It's easy to be out of church. It's easier to be out of church, out of the Bible, out of prayer, than it is to try to get back that habit again. How many agree with that? You stop going to church, it's hard to come back again. It's hard to get out of that house, get in that car, come back to church again. When you stop reading your Bible and you just put it aside because life is consuming you and your sin's consuming you, whatever's going on, it's hard to get say, i got to make time now. Well, wait a minute, before all this, you did make time. You made time for a prayer and Bible. And somehow it's too much now. You can't, you can't do it no more. And 1 Corinthians 15, 58 says this, Therefore, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as ye know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Amen? Can I tell you this morning, folks, this church of Thessalonians knew how to work Know how to work the work of faith. They knew how to love with the labor of love. They knew how to keep it keep it going and not stop and not 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 lag back. They were diligent. They kept moving. They kept moving. They kept working. They kept walking and walking with God, walking in truth, walking in love. They never stopped. Everything was consumed around the things of God. I think it's a good church to learn from. Amen. Because what, what's the alternative? Ready? Look up here. The things of your flesh. The pleasures of this life and world, and maybe even your sin. And then God gets pushed out. Folks, we need to be like the Thessalonica church, amen? We really do. Every head bowed, every eye closed. We're going to pray. <clears throat> every. I don't know what kind of Christian church you want this to be, but I hope that we want to be like what the New Testament church is. Next week we're going to put everything down, we're going to look at everything, and we're going to see what, how we match up here. But I want you to know the church is the people. We need more God's people to step up and do exactly what all these things we learned today and other, other times. Father, I pray that you would touch the hearts of your children today. I pray that you would touch the hearts that we can rise up to be the Christian we need to be and the church we need to be here at Charity Baptist. Lord, I pray for those that are, are on the fence, for those that are being wooed by the world, that, Lord, I pray that you would love them and draw them back to your bosom and be the Christian they need to be and be the church that they need to be here at Charity Baptist Church. Lord, help us now as we're getting closer to the revival meeting. We know that the devil's going to fight harder, but we're going to persevere and be diligent and keep pressing forward with our work of faith and our labor of love. Father, bless us now as we go. In Jesus' name, amen.